first two items on that list, you have the tools and needs of participation. And with the third, that change in attitude gives you a, a real desire to participate. And so here's a great example. This is um, Obama speaking in Berlin in the summer of 2008, so at the run-up to the US presidential election. And this is just a photograph that I happened to come across. It's from the Associated Press. It was on the cover of the New York Times. And it's an interesting photo. But what's more interesting is as you zoom into it, getting closer and closer, you can see that everyone in the audience has a digital camera or some sort of recording device. Literally every single person. And you can see that this guy's even holding up his laptop for the, for the webcam to take photos like that. And everywhere you pan around this photo, it was a very large photo, everywhere you pan around, you can see every single person's doing it. And in fact, in uh, let's see, this frame, I counted 43 cameras and there was 61 people. So, and there could be some cameras that aren't visible right there. It's cameras, it's uh, little video cams, um, there are phones. It's pretty remarkable. It, I'm cheating a little bit here because not all of these people are recording for the purpose of sharing those, those photos, but a large number of them are. And you can see, of course, after I saw that photo, I was in a cafe and reading the newspaper, I saw it, I went online and looked at the photos that people were uploading from the event. And the, you know, there's some of them are very good. I'll go back. You know, it's just as good as the photos that were coming from the wire services, from the agency France Press or Reuters or AP. And a lot of them were like this, um, or this one, or this one, which is very much what it's like going to any kind of big public event or a concert nowadays. You're bathed in the blue glow of the LCD of the people in front of you with their digital recording devices. So for better or worse, this is the way, uh, this is the way we do it. Um, because this is a shorter presentation than Conscious of Time, it ripped out a chunk about Web 2.0 in general, but you've heard people talk about Web 2.0 enough. Here's what was happening while we were talking about Web 2.0, and this is a graph going back to 1990, and I guess I should update it to show 2010. Um, this is around the time that I first came online, in uh, 1992. It was the, a little bit before the, the web, I mean, it, technically the web existed, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't used well enough that people were really aware of it, even with the small numbers of hundreds of thousands of people online. And by the way, this blue line is the number of people participating in um, online communities or online social so they have the beginning of the dot-com era, uh, the early days of blogging, Friendster, the first large social network, MySpace shortly after, and then Facebook all in one big bunch, World of Warcraft, uh, and the launch of Twitter. And you can see that this graph is very much up and to the right. And I should say that it's totally made up, that it's not based on any data. Um, it doesn't really matter, because I, I'm sure I can find some data that match that. Um, and it is, Trivially true. I mean, I don't think anyone would disagree with the shape of the curve there. And if you extrapolate out, we can argue about Android versus iPhone. Um, I guess that's more of a US argument. Um, we can argue about the digital divide and how long it'll take for uh, developing nations to get wired up. But this is the direction things are going. I and mean, that much is very clear. Um, and it's very clear that our grandchildren and their grandchildren and 10 or 20 or 30 generations hence, uh, the lives of those people will be radically different than the lives of our ancestors in great measure because of the internet and technology. So all this is an evolution of the role of computing in people's lives. Um, it wasn't that long ago, a generation and a half roughly, that a computer was a job title. It was a person who sat in a room with sheets of paper and added up numbers. Um, and we went through this process of replacing human activity that involved large amounts of calculation of computers. And this is actually, I think, the most interesting way to think about it. The first era of computation was all about very specific applications. I and mean, the very, the patches to develop uh, computers in the first place was for anti-aircraft missiles to, to do the kind of calculations on the trajectory in which you have to fire a missile to take down an airplane. And then there was computers literally developed for specific applications, specific, specific purposes, like the census uh, number Machines. And then we moved in the late 70s, the earliest, maybe in the early 80s, to the era of computers that we're most familiar with, which is document based. So the locus of interaction is about you have an Excel file that you want to edit, uh, or you have an image that you want to um, change, and you load up an application um, relative to the document that you're working with. And now we're moving to something different. And I 
think that um, this is trivially true if you consider the CPUs that are in local phones that uh, encode your voice into the packets that are sent for CDMA or GSM uh, transmission. Most of the CPUs in the world, most of the time, are spending their time on connecting to human beings. And I think even if you took out the cell phones, most of the CPUs are doing that. And it allows this dynamic that for people who are online very early, say the early 1990s or um, all, all through that decade, this experience of finding someone else who shares your interests um, or shares your passions or um, someone you want to share your life with or someone who has the answer to a question you have, um, that's becoming more and more of an everyday experience or something that we can take for granted. And this wasn't the case early on. You know, the, the early web forums that were for people who uh, were very interested in model trains or who were survivors of breast cancer or who were um, interested in translating Greek poetry. Uh, it was very difficult to find those people. And if you lived in a small town, uh, it might be difficult even to find someone to play chess against. And you could find those people online. And that was more and more you can find anyone for any purpose. Oh, I have time out, but it's good because I'm almost finished. And if you think about the basic questions that people will ask in the study of the humanities, broadly speaking, philosophy, literature, art, sociology, anthropology, these are the kinds of questions. And these are the kinds of questions that today, to the extent they don't take account of the internet and they don't take account of the web and the, the social nature of those interactions, I think are, are not, they're not answerable in, in interesting ways. The internet is a component to any realistic answer to these questions, to any thought about who we are um, as human beings, as a species, as individuals, as a society. And you go back to this image, uh, every single one of those people has their own motivation for recording this event. It might be for their own personal catalog, as an emblem to show that they were there, just that people collect pins at the Olympics. Um, or it might be because they're documenting and archiving the world for future generations. So I'll come back to this quote one last time um, and encourage people to think about it over the course of the day. I was lucky to be able to go first. But if you think about those, uh, those claims we hear in the short term for how a particular product or service will revolutionize things, maybe you take those with a grain of salt, maybe the uh, estimates from the current data is not so great, but certainly over the course of generations, over the course of even our lifetimes, the uh, impact, I think, we continually got to estimate. And I'll leave it with that. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes left for questions. Thank you very much, Stuart, for this great uh, this presentation. Uh, you brought in a good sense of humor. Thank you. So now there's a little time left for one or two questions. So uh, first I want to check if here are questions in the, in the auditorium. We have microphones here in the middle. If not, we have a look at the Twitter wall because we've got a lot of questions here. Um, people ask, um, licensing, licensing of media online is still an ongoing question. Any option, opinion about that? It's a, it's a little bit of a nightmare. I think that um, some forms of media have much more, uh, much stronger and stranger contractual entanglements. Music is probably the biggest one. Um, my current project is working on a web-based massively multiplayer game. Um, a big component of that is getting great illustrators, great musicians. On the illustration side, it's fairly easy. For musicians, even if it's someone that we are paying by the hour to compose music for us and is happy to do it, there's a large number of rights that become more and more complicated. We saw this all the time with Flickr, letting people choose Creative Commons licenses and getting into debates about public domain versus um, contracting. It's, um, I, I, don't know, I have many opinions about it. It's very complicated. It's not getting any less complicated. So I think the, the fact that it's still easier for, for most people to pick on a TV show or a movie that they want to watch than it is.